Welcome, listeners, to www.ironradio.org, the website and podcast for all things strength sports and sports nutrition. Thanks for listening. Good morning, everybody. This is Lonnie Lowry. We are on Iron Radio. I am a professor of about 20 years. Uh, just filling in here the first introduction here. Phil's got a game, a uh, football game. Uh, former competitive bodybuilder and uh, podcaster for a really long time. Hey, okay, what's going on? It's Dr. Mike Nelson, uh, creator of the Flex Diet Cert and the Physiologic Flexibility Certification. And <clears throat> had a fun time presenting in Connecticut at the NEC conference. Jason Leiden and CrossFit Milford this past weekend. And back down here in uh, South Padre, Texas, hanging out, working, kiteboarding for the next month. Cool. Mike, did I say that you were like in number one in the in some of the in one of the categories? Oh, that was just for I I missed it by like point two kilometers for distance on Tuesday for just riding. That was in North America, like Volvo. I was like number twelve or something. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is Coach Durrell from Strength Guild in Kansas City, and I am a. Strength and conditioning coach for the people. Yeah, gym owner. <laughs> All right. We have a study to talk about in the first half, and then Drell's going to lead a discussion in the second half about load management when it comes to uh, performing, training, performing, stuff like that. Okay, this first one I actually got uh, through my wife, uh, and it's via Science Alert. This is by Michelle Starr, October of this year so. The reporting is brand new, although I looked at the paper, which is a a July paper, but still new this year. Major study claims to identify the root cause of obesity, fructose. Now, we've ripped on fructose for years here. It bypasses some of the controlling steps in glycolysis, right? Your carb breakdown pathway and blah, blah, blah. Anyway, it kind of goes beyond that. This looks like a paper that's attempting to be a unifying theory of obesity, like How do we bring together all these different ones? And what do I mean by these theories? Bear with me, I'll I'll tell you. So let's just go to Michelle Starr's reporting. It says, fructose, a new paper proposes, is the pernicious little demon driving so many human metabolisms toward obesity. Although it's not the biggest source of calorie intake, it does trigger the urge to eat fatty foods at higher quantities, resulting in overindulgence in food. And this is from uh, Richard Johnson and colleagues, University of Colorado and Schutz Medical Campus. Now, as I'm looking at the reporting, and I'm not a big fan of most science reporters, I think our listeners know, but it says that fructose causes low ATP in cells, and that's the problem. It drains you of ATP. It, it makes it sound like, and I'm like, what? That's not. Oh. That's contrary to. It's an energy <laughs> source. Yeah. Um, and and yet, and yet, when I went and looked, let me read you some stuff from the actual study, and. Again, yes, there are caveats, but if you go to the actual study, this is in the journal Obesity, the fructose survival hypothesis as a mechanism for unifying the various obesity hypotheses. So again, Richard Johnson and colleagues says, the pathogenesis of obesity remains contested. Although genetics is important, the rapid rise in obesity in Western culture and the diet suggests an environmental component. Today, some of the major hypotheses for obesity include... The energy balance hypothesis, and everybody before we hit record, Mike and I were talking about, like, that's the hypothesis, really. Yeah, that's I kind mean, of the thing. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, if you consume more energy and carbon than you uh, use up and exhale, uh, you know, the carbon, and you're going to retain, you're going to be, be bigger. <laughs> it's, it's thermodynamics. Anyway, the carb-insulin model, which we've heard about for years, right? It's not fat. It's the carbs and the insulin spikes, that kind of thing. And something that Joey Antonio brought up with me recently, and he's going to be on the show next week, everybody, but the protein leverage hypothesis, Mm -hmm. uh, and the general idea there is your body needs protein and all the carbs and fats that we're consuming is just dilutional factor, really. And I'm I'm painting with a broad brush here, but you you end up consuming this ancillary fats and carbs while you're trying to get the protein. Um, Anyway, so that's one uh, hypothesis. And then the uh, oil seed hypothesis, and the idea with that is that we've been introduced, especially with stuff like corn oil, safflower oil, some of these what I call junk fats, just m- increasing linoleic acid intakes, right? That omega-6 polyunsaturate that's really common and main part of a lot of these oils, 
And that's one of the other ones that they talk about here. It says each hypothesis has its own support, uh, creates controversy, of course, and what's driving obesity, because some of these things almost look exclusive. They almost look like they're competing, conflicting uh, theories. Here we propose that all hypotheses are largely correct and can be unified by another dietary hypothesis, the fructose survival hypothesis. It says fructose is unique in resetting ATP levels to a lower level in the cell and has a consequence of suppressing mitochondrial function. Now, that's interesting to me. It says while blocking the replacement of ATP from fat. So apparently it's blunting uh, beta oxidation. You know, I know what Mike's probably thinking. You know, carbs will blunt fat oxidation. I mean, yeah. get on a treadmill, <laughs> you know, and, and thought. <laughs> you know, a metabolic car, and you're going to see that, yeah, the RER goes up, goes right? Up. Your fat oxidation goes away when you consume, wow. when you consume something. Anyway, it says low intracellular ATP do result in carb-dependent hunger, impaired uh, satiety, that is, uh, metabolic effects that increase the intake of energy-dense fats. Um, So that's kind of what they're talking about. Now, when I went to look at this, because, of course, I look at fructose like a carb. It's going to enter glycolysis. It's going to provide ATP, not reduce it. What's going on? Here's what the researchers say that I don't think this uh, science reporter covered to this extent, probably because a lot of people don't care, uh, unfortunately, about mechanisms. It says uh, basically that foods provide ATP. However, one nutrient acts differently, and that is fructose. In a starved state, fructose does act like any other nutrient and provides uh, ATP by being rapidly converted to glucose. However, in a fed state, the fructose acts to lower ATP in a cell, while at the same time blocking the restoration of ATP uh, from fat. And then it says in parentheses, by blocking fatty acid oxidation. This mechanism is mediated by a specific enzyme, fructokinase C, K-H-K-C. And that has been detailed in another review. I think it's based on some of their own work, if I recall. And involves rapid consumption of ATP in the cell. So, you know, use up the ATP you have, followed by a uric acid-dependent inhibition of mitochondrial production of ATP. So now we got, you know, urate in the whole mix. I'm starting thinking gout and, you know, purine intake. And so there's a lot of stuff that goes into this paper, but it really does try to, you know, put fructose at the center of it all. Now, not having read this, uh, Mike, what are what are your thoughts about this? But like, at least as far as from what I'm sharing. I mean, historically, we've tried... To pin obesity on almost everything and there's everything from you know we had the high fructose stuff which is kind of related to this you have like they mentioned the carbohydrate insulin model which has generally been debunked for the most part i mean in terms of obesity you can go all the way back in time and look up the lipostatic theory of obesity which was based on the regulation of fats only that you accumulate too many fats because you're oxidation is going down and not matching and there's this feedback regulation mechanism and if you take in more fats than what you're used to your body generally does not ramp up oxidation of it if you consume more carbohydrates than what you take and these are in metabolically healthy people you will ramp up carbohydrate oxidation to some point but pretty much all of them have kind of over time fallen apart (laughs) um yeah. Another thing I would say is it's anecdotal, and there's some data to support this, although it's definitely more on the animal uh, side. I do think that if you have an issue with carbohydrate metabolism, that those people I do find, if we put them on a metabolic cart, we see they can't downregulate to use fats very well, even in a fasted condition. Um, they do tend to overeat more on the carbohydrate side, You know, the argument there is that they're trying to regulate blood glucose. Their body is stuck on the carbohydrate into the side. It can't downregulate to use fats. So it's signaling, you know, hunger and these other mechanisms to make sure glucose levels don't go down too well. Um, But again, I would argue that that's a metabolically dysregulated state and you've got a whole host of other shit that's not working. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, But again, I mean, that's, that's kind of my bias, you know, looking at metabolic flexibility that hard to say if it's a chicken or the egg but as you become more metabolically inflexible your body's solution then is well let's just go get more carbohydrates to try to fix that and 
We then also live in an environment where we're getting carbohydrates, especially not the highest quality ones with very low fiber and micronutrients, is really easy to do. So is it you know, your own metabolism? If we took those people and stuck them back in a cave in Paleolithic times, they might re-regulate themselves, but it's probably a combination of a whole bunch of things. So it's a yeah, interesting idea. I'd have to check into it more. I haven't read much on this one. Yeah, it sounds like there's quite a number of of these theories, the kind of hypotheses that are cropping up for discussion lately with the protein leverage one and the oil seed one. This has a focus of sort of this storage mode thing, you know, where periods of starvation and this and that, how we're in a environment of plenty. And I mean, that underwrites a lot of what we're talking about. I totally hear what you're saying about like inability to burn fat. I remember telling you once I had an overweight student this was in a dietetics program, and I had new, normally done this lab in exercise science classes, but basically I was trying to illustrate the crossover effect of exercise, right? How you yeah. have to, your RER goes up because you start oxidizing carbohydrates to meet the metabolic demand when you're ramping up a treadmill. And she got on that treadmill fasted, and her RER, I don't know, was like 0.9. She was not burning fat in a fasted state. Like, how do you show a crossover from fat use to carb use with a ramping up treadmill? When they get on it at rest and they're just burning carbs. And then I'm like, all right, I don't know. Maybe you're under a lot of stress. Are you sure you didn't eat? Because obviously she would have eaten something. It would have done that. So she came in later. This is a good student, but overweight, almost certainly pre-diabetic. And same thing. So I really had to revise my conclusion, you know, that when you don't work with exercise science students that are so fit and, if you will, metabolically flexible and that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, wow. Uh, you know, I couldn't even do the lab with her. I had to use someone else and try not to embarrass her, but, um, she could not burn fat. Like her body metabolically did not understand. I have all this body fat and I need to use it. <laughs> uh, she didn't seem to have the ability to do that. I mean, she's, she's blowing a 0.9 on the metabolic car burning carbs at rest or 0.88 or whatever it was. I, it was years ago, but it was really high. And I was just amazed, right? Cause you know, for you exercise physiology nerds out there, you're looking for like a 0.72, 0.74, some low low RER number suggesting fat oxidation. And you know, she couldn't do it. Well, okay. I was just going to say that fat oxidation is incredibly variable, even across a healthy population. <clears throat> I've had a couple of people where like the lowest they got on a metabolic cart was 0.87 at just low levels of exercise. And so then we started pulling like blood lactate on them and they're just chewing through lactate like crazy. Their wow. HRV is like just, you know, almost single digits. Their resting heart rate is high. It's like so stress just, hormones, like yeah, cortisol just, kind of thing. Yep. They're just whacked on the sympathetic side, which is pushing their body to use carbohydrates at rest yeah. for survival. Right. Um, yeah. And there's some, there's some old stuff from, uh, this showed up in one of the studies I did. Uh, Gadecki did a study in 2015. I uh, held just study in 1999, where basically they just took people off of the street, you know, generally healthy people, put them on a low intensity exercise. They baseline them to their VO2 max, so they're all working to the same percentage of their max. And what they found was that these are all fasted people. Their ability to use fat varied from 23 to 90 percent across the board. So some people who are generally considered healthy, these were not, you know, diabetics or anything like that. They were fine. Mm -hmm. They could downregulate. They could use fat, no problem. But a whole bunch of those people just could not downregulate that far to use fat, which to me, I found that like fascinating because all the yeah. exercise phys books, everything else says that if you're, you know, right. generally healthy, you can downregulate to do this. But there's a huge amount of variability in that. Yeah, that's textbook, right? I mean, that's what I always saw yeah. with the exercise science students. I, you yeah, know, I, I don't know what young fit people like most of the time. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. And I was just, you know, sort of um, trying to demonstrate the crossover effect. I wasn't looking yeah. for any type <laughs> of pathology or anything. This says um, the source of fructose is not simply from dietary fructose, but also generated from glucose. This occurs by activating the polyol pathway, aldose reductase sorbitol dehydrogenase pathway. So listeners are already tuning out. <laughs> uh, it looks like they're doing some biochemical gymnastics here. But, you know, maybe this is how you do it. it. It seems to center around mitochondrial dysregulation, which you might guess. Yeah. I mean, you know, it says this can occur from excessive glucose in intake or 
excessive glucose in general, such as diabetes or high carb diets, can also occur when the rate limiting enzyme aldose reductase is stimulated. This occurs when animal senses it's in stress. This is to your point, I think, Mike, such yeah. as hypoxia, ischemia, increased serum osmolality. It says humans are particularly susceptible to activating the fructose survival switch because of the high intake of fructose and added sugars, uh, including sucrose in the diet, of course. Uh, from foods that generate fructose, alcohol and especially beer. Aha, this is what I was just speculating. Uh -oh. Alcohol and especially beer also generate fructose due to both osmotic stimulation of the polyol pathway and from the generation of uric acid. So there seems to be a lot going into this, but they're trying to put fructose at the center. I was just made aware, honestly, of the protein leverage hypothesis, or at least any updates on it, uh, because of what uh, Dr. Antonio was saying. And now we've got the fructose survival hypothesis which, you know, has you kind of screwed. I think they're saying that, you know, the fructose in a high fructose and high fat environment. To me, it kind of sounds obvious, I guess. Like, yeah, I don't think you're going to eat a lot of high fructose corn syrup kinds of foods if you're trying to not be fat. And obviously this is meant more for uh, the population in general and not someone who's burning through a bunch of their glycogen all the time and in a semi-starved state and everything, but... Um, I wanted to ask Jarrell about his people. I mean, there's all these theories, you know, whether it's the carb insulin model, like Mike said, that's really been critiqued pretty heavily. Uh, at the same time, we're constantly eating carbs. A lot of people are, you know, or the uh, oil seed hypothesis, people are eating too much fat and inflammatory fats and that kind of stuff. Or I'm guessing most of your people don't care about the mechanisms. Or, I don't know. Or do they? I mean, some might. I'm... Some will listen to stuff and, you know, but part of the thing is for them, a lot of times it's hard to use that information. And so like when they try to use it, it always comes off weird. But, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I mean, for the most part in terms of nutrition, I mean, honestly, like I mean, normal people, it's going to be stability of their diet in general. Like not necessarily just always like the calories in calories out, but like there's no consistency to their nutrition. Like they, maybe go to the same places. Let's say you're way obese or whatever, like their nutrition, they might go to the same, you know, fast food places or something, but they're not eating like the same week to week. So they have these wide ups and downs during their week. So like finding some stability in their like day to day and their week to week that by itself, plus protein can help anchor them a little bit. Mm -hmm. But sometimes they, people are a little bit more, interested and some of it too is like how long does it take to like overcome uh, like you're saying with your student and you know Mike, like that that level of resistance like starting out you know it's going to take time of like working out eating and yep. you might not see that much change on the surface before the ball starts rolling and it's like hard to keep people engaged and confident in the process when you know most people sign up to a program and they think I'm going to do X, Y, and Z, and boom, pound, you know, pounds about to start melting off. But it's really not how it works, and it's really tough to kind of get people to kind of jump on the side of that. So that more than what I would say is any related to any of the um, actual mechanisms of what my people would deal with first is like the consistency of the process, like finding an ability to be consistent and letting your body kind of adapt to the stimulus of the diet or whatever is going to be you know more what i deal with than it is going to be with getting deep down into the mechanisms and like if fruit was like fructose in general was my you know something that i consider i'd, I'd be doing pretty good yeah <laughs> well they do i mean they try to point out early on that because of the fiber and other the nutrients and you know fruits and whatnot it's probably not fruits it's probably sugary drinks and all that kind of stuff and and all that sort of thing it's a good point i mean i used to tell people right off the bat you want to do and not athletes right get sugary pop out of your diet there's just there's no reason for it uh, don't do it i almost rather see them drink diet pop than sugary pop high fructose corn syrup pop i know that's very controversial because of all the you know the crap that artificial sweeteners alternative sweeteners are getting um with the microbiome of the gut and you know, all that kind of stuff but um, it's just a, it's a big problem. And then, you know, you eat a French a large French fry while you're chugging a 64 ounce big gulp of high fructose corn syrup, you know, 
I, I once read an article called Thanks for Guzzling Fructose. It was like a spoof on Thank You for Smoking, that movie, because there's a lot of money to be made. And, of course, they've tried to address this in all kinds of ways with the obesity taxes, you know, on the sugary beverages. Mm-hmm. And I don't know. Um, it doesn't seem to be working. We're fatter than ever. What you're talking about, Jarrell, I think makes sense to me is they need to anchor with something like protein that would also address the protein leverage hypothesis. I mean, I think there's some truth to each one of these. What I would like to see is some analysis, almost like a multivariate regression model where, you know, what percent does each one contribute? How much of this is being in a high carb environment all the time in high insulin states? How much of this is the the fact that we're so damn sedentary? Again, to Jarrell's point, like you got to give people – eight weeks to actually build some mitochondrial mass if, if they don't have any practically, you know, it's certainly nothing like an athlete who can burn fat at the drop of a hat. I mean, at least when they're healthy, it comes down to that kind of thing. What are some of the gold nuggets? Well, don't drink a bunch of high fructose corn syrup. Fructose does screw with your metabolism. There's not many sources of it in nature. I've said that for years and years, unless you, you know, break into a, um, a beehive, but how often would you do that? you know, as a hunter gatherer, it's really hard to eat enough apples, for example, like here in Ohio, to get a huge fructose overload, 100 grams in 20 minutes. No way. Uh, and I just think it's it's almost back to that kind of paleo thing, too. You just don't see this kind of stuff in nature. I think the reason that we're not really turning this wagon around is because health educators are delving into mechanisms and they're trying to work with clients, but we're constantly – you know, going upwind against the food industry. And I know the feds are pushing hard for lower sugar finally, but at the same time, I don't want to start demonizing sugar. Like we used to demonize fat I, that blew up in our faces. I think this is kind of to Mike's metabolic flexibility approach is you, if you demonize just one thing, it gives people to, something to think about, but I don't know what you do, uh, Jarrell, like, as far as the first eight weeks keeping people engaged, unless you just focus on strength or something that you know is going to change because it's not going to be visible changes in body fat probably in the first two months. Yeah. Yeah, So, I mean, I'm just curious about the, so even with that process, right? So you have someone who like their body is essentially resistant to the the process in general, right? Like they're almost like it's your body is rejecting it essentially. Like you, go to set their calories, let's say they're, if you average out their calories for the week and they average 4,000 and maybe it's lower on some days, higher on like the wide shifts or whatever. And then you take them and you say, we're doing 2,000 calories a day, every day. That's like the, that's your number. You got to hit that. It takes it like no one, no one's behavior changes right out of the gate. It's really tough to get them to change it wholesale anyway. We'll say you get it within 10%. Their frustration and like the majority of the frustration is going to be like psychological, right? Because while they're probably making progress, like in terms of your, their body's going to start adapting. But the longer you've been in a situation of like obesity is like the more resistance it's going to take to like just break through that. So like getting people engaged in that idea of it, where it's like, no, you just have to hit, like just have to do this for. You know, whatever. we might not see anything. We might not see the scale change necessarily, although most people will if they're being consistent. But just taking it like, t- like convincing people to take the time to like do the the part that doesn't feel like it's working. Yeah, it, it's a challenge. Man. You're right. Be- and the behavioral side, oh, my God, it's, it's just incredibly frustrating. And again, it, I, I, I tend to be a conspiracy theorist with some of these giant corporations and they're about margins and about profits and all that kind of stuff. And the way I used to deal with that was we talked about for years on Iron Radio about if you keep fats relatively fixed and protein relatively fixed, carbs are what swing the most dramatically, I think, when you're trying to like diet for a contest. I know this is a different um, context than just ongoing dieting. Yeah, if you're getting 40 protein and let's say eight fiber every time you eat first, like before you, you know, do a bunch of other stuff, uh, that's got to at least help, uh, I would think. But anyway, yeah, I just wanted to share the paper because it was another one of these, you know, diet theories that come across my desk. And I think the paper itself is a bigger deal than what the the person was saying. Like, oh, here's a new theory. It's all about fructose. It's the unifying theory part that I actually found was interesting. They're trying to say this is at the center of all this, 
but yeah, there's a lot of uh, mitochondrial function and enzyme and biochemistry and stuff going on in that article. So we'll see if it goes anywhere, I guess. Um, it's like the uni- unifying theory of physics, you know. Uh, good luck with that. <laughs> All right, let's go to break, and when we come back, uh, we're going to talk about uh, load management, as I understand it. So we'll be right back. Hey, everybody. Iron Radio is back, and in an expanded way. What can you expect? Well, first, you can get it simulcast every week on the NutritionRadio.org network, as well as on the original podcast. It'll appear regularly on iTunes, Spotify, and all your favorite podcasting sites. We have a new Iron Radio slash Nutrition Radio Facebook page as well. Please check us out. We're even backed up on YouTube. Second, please tell your friends who are longtime loyal listeners that they may see emails that share just the episode link and the show notes. This is a new thing, and we hope it will build community. Third, if you are a supporting member in the past, we may prompt you to resume through PayPal but we will confirm each and every donor before reinstating that membership category. We'll never just restart your $4 auto payments without agreement from you. And of course, we will accept new members moving forward as well. Starting back slowly and honorably is the goal. And lastly, expect the sister show, Nutrition Radio, to expand into once-weekly 45- to 60-minute episodes with guest co-hosts covering the same nerdy nutrition news that's been broadcast for a few months now in daily 10-minute clips. We hope that an expanded presence will get you the news, education, banter, and guests that's made Iron Radio's community so loyal from the start. You are appreciated. Uh, welcome back, everyone. Today, I wanted to just just bring up the topic of because it's kind of going around in the NBA that... Um, they've kind of cut their guys off from what they call like load management. So basically a lot of their star players would, you know, take a game off. There are a lot of some of the older stars that would take, that wouldn't do like back to backs or anything like that. And the NBA came out this year and said that the data that they have collected, which I haven't found anywhere yet. If I do, I'll talk about it again, but um, does not support uh, the theory of load management that, the injury rates haven't gone down. That the um, the product of the NBA hasn't essentially improved because uh, their stars still not only don't play in the games that they load manage, but also still end up injured uh, and still end up getting you know injuries towards the end of the season. Which in the NBA, if you don't know, is it's 82 game regular season that starts. I think it started this week and then. The playoffs start, I think it's like late, or it starts in basically April. So it's a long season, three to four games per week, and then each game is 48 minutes, 48 total uh, game minutes. Uh, so and, and every team like manages things differently, but they just recently came out and suggested that the load management is not effective in the in keeping the athletes healthy. And I, just because I've been in like weightlifting and you have like kind of the European lifters who are like lifting every day, this debate has been a part of like lifting culture for a long time. So I was curious what you guys' thoughts were on the idea of load management. I mean, my thought is that I think the idea makes sense. <laughs> the as always, the, the devil's in the details, right? Our, I would be curious to see if you went back in time. Did they ever do any type of load management? Have we just seen more injuries now than we used to? I don't know the answer to that. I don't follow a lot of NBA real closely. Um. <clears throat> But you see this even in lifting models, right? If you if you look at the Bulgarian system, my understanding, Darrell can correct me if I'm wrong, is they just do or did a super high volume, and if you just couldn't hack it, then great, we got another guy in line. We'll get him instead. So we <laughs> we just sort of self-select for people that fit our system. Granted, with something like the MBA that you can't really do that, you're self-selecting for a different skill. Um, and then I also wonder, did you, 
do they take enough time off to even be meaningful? Right. So if you've got an 82 game season and you took five games off and I don't know what their system really is. I'm just using that as an example. It's probably not correct. That's probably not going to matter. Like how many, how much time would you have to take off to even see a difference? Which I know is also, you know, weighted by, you know, most sports that are competitive. Most of the athletes want to play. Obviously, if you're a star player, everybody on your team, the coach, the organization wants you to play because it's in the best interest of winning. You know, contrast that to, well, we can't have all our star players injured if we make the playoffs either. So, Yeah, I, so load management in the NBA is pretty new. And actually, probably the biggest pushback against load management is the old school guys because they essentially they never did. Never did. They got paid less and so on and so forth. I mean, so that's, I mean, maybe a little bit of a social, you know. Yeah. No, these darn millennials kind of thing. But um, it hasn't been a thing before. But they're, I mean, they do have, I'll give some credence to what they say because it's like we used to play with, you know, worse shoes. We didn't have, you know, in a lot of the NBA teams, they used to fly commercial. So it wasn't oh, yeah. like they had private team jets or anything. They didn't That's have all dude. the treatment. Yeah, and then so they're like, <laughs> and yet we played more games. Like on average, their rate of play is higher than a lot of newer yeah. NBA players. Now I will say that I think there is some cultural stuff to it because the professionalism of the NBA, like the way it's become, is like just with all, like this. These guys get paid. On average, like NBA players get paid way more money than even like some of your favorite NFL guys. Yeah. And so there is kind of some social aspect to people who don't even like playing basketball necessarily, but are like good at it, mm-hmm. who come in and those contracts are almost like in the NFL, there's not as much guaranteed money. But in the NBA, it's like pretty much all guaranteed. So they come in, get a $200 million contract and they might not do anything or play for the whole life of that contract. I mean, Ben Simmons is, is an example of that. <laughs> I know we were talking about this before we were recording, but I feel like greed is a, a risk factor here. I mean, I think about how the corporate world works. I think about how athletics works. Yeah, salaries are bigger, but you know, there's money to be made. This is a business, and they're going to drive these guys into the ground, I'm afraid. Uh, there was a researcher... Kenta, uh, a Swedish guy. Let me just read some quotes. This is from a 1998 paper. I read one of his books cover to cover. It was called Enhancing Recovery. I highly recommend it for people who tend to overtrain or overdo it. The idea here, of course, is a break from training, not just from game day. But, you know, game days are especially intense. Uh, it's called Overtraining and Recovery, a Conceptual Model, Kenta and Hosman. So I'm going to be a nerd here and just read some science stuff. But I do think it, it's related It says, fiercer competition between athletes and a wider knowledge of optimal training regimens dramatically influence current training methods. A single training bout per day was previously considered sufficient, whereas today people regularly train twice a day or more. Consequently, the number of athletes who are overtraining and have insufficient rest is increasing. Positive overtraining can be good, right? But, of course, too much can be bad, um, causing maladaptation uh, and staleness to occur. And again, beyond just injury, physiological, psychological, biochemical, and immune symptoms must be considered both independently and together uh, to try to understand this athlete's staleness syndrome. They say an athlete failing to recover within 72 hours has presumably negatively overtrained. So they've overdone it. They're in an overreach state. And if they keep doing that for even a short period of time, their performance is going to drop. Their psychology is going to suffer. You can see it in their blood work, definitely in the psychological stuff. Uh, When I've used their TQR model, the total quality recovery model from these guys, I've done it with myself because I was overtraining my butt off when I was trying to get ready for a show. Um, The psychological stuff seems to hit first, you know, perceptual things like your RPE, you know, something that feels like it should be a 12 on a 20 scale is now a 15. It's an it's an 18. Things just feel hard, and you're starting to have higher 
perceived exertion. You're starting to feel exhausted. You're getting head colds. Um, you know, a vertical jump, I always thought, would, would be a decent way to assess this to see if that starts to sag. Uh, I mean, because you don't want to do, oh, let's do a run to exhaustion to see if you're overtrained. Like, that doesn't make sense to me. <laughs> uh, but something brief like a hand grip squeeze or a vertical jump, uh, you know, I know there are different kinds of overtraining. There's sympathetic and, and parasympathetic kinds of overtraining, but um, I think some of that comes into play here. I know what we're talking about is game days and not just training. I would think any amount of rest period, because that's a great point, Mike. Like, how long? Do you know? Right. What is the data? What do the data say? Um, if it was very proactive, these guys are talking about how you have to put back these TQR points. So stretching, meditating, hot, cold contrast, showers, massage, music, whatever it is that you do, go proactively do it. Nap, snacks, right? Obviously, nutrition's a huge part of it. How do you keep them uh, from falling apart? Because I just think my first thoughts when I hear that drill is that there's lots of ways to fall apart and for poor performance to sag. And I would like to see the numbers on that, too. Like they say there's not more injury, so we're going to drive these guys harder. Yeah, but is your performance sagging? And if so, you know, to my point, how long do you have to give them off? It feels like a partial picture to me. And I'm always raising an eyebrow about about corporate greed <laughs> with this kind yeah. of stuff. Oh, yeah. That, I mean, that's absolutely a part of it. I mean, like, so they're, one thing that they've really struggled with in the last – to me, NBA is like almost in kind of a what the old baseball spiral was, where pre the home run, uh, you know, boom or the home run race with McGuire, and then where their baseball was kind of like starting to lose some interest. I think the NBA is kind of there, but a lot of times it's you know people pay their money to come see you know your the stars on the team, and then they get there and the stars aren't playing and that kind of thing. So the NBA is really suffering from. You know, that plus obviously the ratings are lower if your guys aren't playing and things like that. So, and there are players within the league right now who disagree with it as well. So there is a little bit of that, like players in the league who are calling out other players for, it's like you're getting paid, you know, whatever it is, hundreds of millions, like no need to take games off. Now, I don't know what's happening on the back end with practice, which I would be kind of curious about as well, because some teams like the like the Miami Heat, like they have this their whole thing is like this culture of you have to be in like ridiculous shape. They have these crazy physical standards. And I mean their injury rates I think are about the same as everyone else's, but I'm not hundred percent sure on like what their like baseline of um training actually is. So I can't speak to that. But there is there is some pushback in the NBA itself where people are like, no, you get paid, and these dudes do they do get paid some money. Like there's like, yeah. I'm trying to think of comparatively some of the contracts. Like, all right, so Patrick Mahomes' contract, and I think he'd be widely regarded as like the, you know, probably the best football player, right? And at a position that gets paid the most. His total contract is worth like you know five hundred million over ten years. There are guys that you will have never heard of in the NBA making two hundred and fifty million over four or oh two hundred fifty over three or four, or something like that. So, and then wow. for that situation to get have gotten worse, I think is where some of the like I would just say maybe corporate frustration is coming from where it's like, okay, these guys go out and play a more dangerous sport, you know, the season's shorter and all that stuff too. So I won't go into that, but mm -hmm. yeah, we can't even keep our guys on the court when they're healthy, you know, for this particular product. I, they'll never do this, but I think actually what would make the most sense here is like a shorter season. Like mm -hmm. 82 games is kind of a crazy amount of Oof. games on the court to be playing, but that would probably make the most sense. It's I a good think, point. Go ahead. Yeah, I don't, I don't know that. Um, like just forcing guys through, you know, 80 plus games in a season is what's necessarily the problem. More so that their season itself is the problem. Personally, that's kind of how I feel about it. Mm -hmm. 
It's a good point about but, the physicality. Like in the NFL, there's obviously more impact kinds of stuff happening versus like overuse, overtraining kind of injury. Uh, that's my naive take on that, right? But what's the what is the career longevity based on injuries and stuff? How does it, how do the NBA compare to the NFL, Gerald? Do you know? I mean, do these guys have longer careers in the NBA because it, it seems way less contact injury abusive? Yeah, no, they have they have longer careers, but also here's and here's the partially the difference between NBA and the NFL. Like strength strength training in the NBA or with basketball is still to this day kind of considered like a, a maybe thing. Not every guy does it. <laughs> And so it's not even like, so some of their stuff is like, they don't take, they don't do the professional things of like making sure they are strong. And I mean, part of the thing with LeBron is that he's been mostly healthy, although he participates in this now because he's a little bit older. And, uh, but you know, one of the interviews I listened to was like, look at him. He's bigger and stronger than everyone. And, you know, lifts weights and make sure to lift weights all year round kind of thing and you know keeps his body strong that is not a commonality where that is a commonality in um nfl like all those guys like you have to do strength training of some sort for the most part and you're an outlier if you don't whereas like in the nba you're kind of like an outlier if you do i mean it's hard to say but yeah i I think about the inputs and outputs, like in that TQR model. I, I just I was fascinated when I learned about that stuff because it feels like a lot of the NBA guys, yes, having some load management and maybe fewer games, that could be one thing because that's on the output side. On the input side, it sounds to me like they could be doing some things to proactively recover. You know that they're not doing if all they want to do is party. And they don't lift, and I don't know <laughs> their whole you know twenty four hour period other than when they're at practice is just you know pizza and weed <laughs> I don't know <laughs> bo- booze uh, it sounds like there's a lot to be done on that side. I'm sure these guys with all the money flush in that sport they mu- they must have access to all this stuff, you know the trainers and the massage therapists and sports nutritionists and sports psychologists and all this kind of stuff. But I don't know, but it sounds to me based on what you're saying. And even from what I've seen, just working with collegiate uh, basketball teams, they don't take advantage of that to the same extent as other sports, you know, supplementation and nutrition and sleep and, and all the things that go into recovery. Oh yeah. Basketball team is one of the worst as far as like, if you're, Anyone out there is an aspiring strength and conditioning coach, and you're like, "Oh, I'm gonna start. I'm looking forward to working with the basketball team. Good luck." <laughs> right? They are, the, they are the worst about strength training. Yeah, same thing with nutrition. Uh, I worked with two uh, D1 basketball teams, and it was it was just a hard sell. I mean, they don't care. They don't care. You know, they're like, I I think the opinion is I'm just this super gifted dude. And I'm like, well, Mr. Gifted, you know, if you put the better fuel in your gifted machine, then your gifted performance will be gifted better. <laughs> and yeah. it's just it's just a hard sell. Uh, if they, You know, you got to get them to actually accept stuff like, you know, you can't. You can't be the best you or a better you without fuel and building blocks. Um, but it's. Yeah, for me, at least my limited experience, it was always a hard sell. Yeah. And I can was kind of my experience, too. I mean, the handful of people I worked with, a couple of them just, they just love playing basketball. They never trained. They just, it's like, what did you do growing up? Like, didn't you lift or do anything? No, I just played basketball. Oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then some of them, as they get closer to the end of their career, realize, oh, like I could maybe extend my career by doing some stuff now and get a little uh-huh. bit more motivated. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, some of that comes down. I won't say the names or anybody, but years ago, uh, a buddy of mine was working with an NBA team and one of their star players came in on day one and they had a fine. Like they only had a lift, I think two or three days a week for like a half hour. It wasn't anything crazy. 
Uh, and he came in and said, and if they didn't, there was a, a fine associated with it. So he came in on day one, just wrote him a check and said, here's my fine for the year. I'm not training. And then <laughs> walked out of the gym. Oh, my God. Oh, <laughs> I was my like, God. Oh, like, I guess that's one way to do it, too. <laughs> yeah, I guess, I guess yeah. so. But I would say it has gotten the people I know work in the system now. It, from what I've seen just through them, it has gotten a lot better over the last five to ten years. Um, and there are some teams that are being a lot more proactive to it. I kind of think like the revolution baseball went through where it was very similar. Like, oh, we just play baseball. And then, you know, now training is just sort of an accepted part of the, the culture for the most part where it wasn't, wasn't always that way. It's a good point that management is, they'd be selecting for a different trait, right? Not just high peak performance people, but the people who can not fall apart under constant game day stress, right? I mean, from the management's perspective, it's like, well, that's good. We'll just weed out the people, no matter how awesome they are, the ones that start falling apart from this constant volume of game day, game day, game day. We'll just weed them out over time and we'll get people who genetically can absorb that level of volume stress, you know, um, they still win in the long run. It's just they're using up their, you know, their athletes. They're they're selecting for different kinds of athletes. You know, we used to talk about how certain in strength sports, it's a, they, they, well, what is good genetics, right? What does that mean? In strength sports, sometimes it's you're resistant to drug side effects, <laughs> you know, like who can keep, keep after these higher dose things and, and uh, not have a lot of medical problems. I can see that happening in a, in a kind of a way here is who is the most genetically resilient. Um, even if they, they don't have the highest peak performance compared to, you know, s- certain other types of athletes, the ones that can just endure the game day abuse, uh, we'll just select them and then we'll have them out on the court every time, pleasing the fans and making the money. I don't know. It's an interesting conversation though. Yeah, and if people want to look up more of the theory, like the main one I've read most of the research from, and again, he's not the only person, is uh, Dr. Tim Gabbard. So he's published a lot of stuff on just general load management and then also like acute to chronic load ratios. So he's published some very interesting research showing that, yeah, at some point people are going to be susceptible to load. You know, that's not a big shocker. Uh, but one of the bigger issues that people, I think, forget about is kind of sort of related to this is acute to chronic ratio. So if you all of a sudden have a big load spike where you go up in volume or intensity over a short period of time, that can then increase your risk for injuries. Mm-hmm. So for most people lifting and most people I work with, I try to gradually kind of wave them up and wave them down. And if they're a little bit more advanced, we may have a week or two that's a little, a little bit higher and we go back down because you can't just linearly go up forever with people who have been doing it for a while. Mm-hmm. But the issue where they really can run into issues is if they go on vacation and say they're going to train and then literally just do nothing. Because um, then they'll come back and they literally had a whole week of zero. So if you start them back at the same volume they were at before, that ends up being a massive load spike because of the difference between zero and even moderate volume of where they were before. So right. over time, I've tried to explain just the basic concept to them and tell them that, you know, hey, if you if you didn't train at all during vacation, great, that's fine. We'll work around it. But for God's sakes, please tell me. So <laughs> we're going to start at a very low volume again and ramp you back up and not try to start where we were before because I thought you trained three days a week and you did nothing at all. Um, And usually once I explain it to them in that context, then they're like, oh, yeah, I actually didn't do anything. You know, because otherwise they're kind of hesitant to be like, oh, yeah, definitely going to do some stuff and then do nothing. Um, So that's one thing I've – it's kind of a pain in the ass to program around a lot. It's not super hard, but knock on wood, I think – it seems to help to reduce the, the risk of injury. And the reality is most of them, you know, if they do compete, they're well out from their competition date. We have plenty of time. So there's no need to even get super aggressive. And I probably even now am less aggressive after I know they've been gone. I just automatically drop people back down and, and kind of have them slowly start up again. 
Yeah, the slow start thing, I think of the metaphor, you know, because I've been running around on RV and stuff, RVs have slow start air conditioners, right? Because if mm. you just flick on that kind of wattage, you blow a line. You'll blow. Oh yeah. (laughs) So you slow start that that you install a special thing. So they slow start. It's kind of to your point, right? So you don't have an injury. You don't blow an injury just like you don't blow the fuse. You have to let it ramp up Um, and it'll do it fairly quickly, but not, you have to actually factor in that spike, you know, and it just sounds very much like what you're talking about there. And it, it makes sense to me. It makes sense to me. Yeah. And I always look at it like a risk reward, right? The risk is, Oh, Man, and there's no way to know if they went, did nothing, and then they started four sets or five sets or something, if that was the cause. But I would feel kind of bad knowing that that definitely could be an issue. And then, like you said, the the risk just isn't really worth the reward. It's like, oh, let's just start back down, you know, lower volume and, and go back up. You know, we've got four months before your next competition. We've got plenty of time, and if you get injured, then your next competition is out the door anyway. Right. You know, we'll have to ask Phil about this next week, too, because I know he has talked over the years about the number of competitions that he would have. I know it's it's apples and oranges. It's not basketball. Yeah. Um, and his thoughts on that, you know, like one big peak versus people being expected to peak hardcore for like, I don't know, every quarter, you know, four times a year, whatever it might be. Uh, like what's realistic and yeah, there's probably this huge genetic component who can who can handle it. Yeah, and I, I also think with even with basketball, while it's not as much of a contact sport as say football, it's still a a contact sport. You have huge people running into each other all the time and yeah. stepping on physical. your feet and ankles and physical. And I just also think with with any of those types of sports, it's really hard to factor out what is the issue, you know, because you've got bodies banging around into each other all the time and Mm -hmm. stuff is just going to happen. And these are not small humans. (laughs) Yep. Well, I appreciate Jarrell. You you bring that topic that it's a, I I know I'm kind of going off on this overtraining kind of thing and that's not exactly what you're talking about, but um, it does kind of bring in to context a lot of social things too. You know, what does, what do the owners and the managers and the coaches expect? What are what are athletes actually capable of if they want to have any kind of career longevity? And obviously the huge salaries are a big part of all this. We're not talking about some, you know, the way that I think uh, a lot of us have competed. Drill, I don't know if you've ever been paid <laughs> to be an athlete, but no. – um, but yeah, it, it does change. It does change some of the expectations. It's like, man, I'm giving you ridiculous salaries. I'm giving you like um, umpteen times the salary of a brain surgeon. And that, <laughs> uh, honestly, that makes me a little sad. It's a societal commentary. <laughs> but you know, everybody plays their role, I guess. All right, all right, you guys, we're out of time. So uh, good stuff. And I guess we'll just catch up with everybody next week. Sounds good. See you. Iron Radio is accepting donations. If you like what we do, the professors, the scientists, the bodybuilding show promoters, the athletes themselves in powerlifting and bodybuilding, um, please consider making a donation or maybe buying something from the ironradio.org store. Uh, We also are accepting supporting members. So for $4 a month, which is frankly less than the bank sneaks out of your account in fees, you can step up and support a form of sort of public radio for the bodybuilding and powerlifting and strength community. The Iron Radio podcast and all of the audio on ironradio.org is for informational purposes only. If you're interested in starting a diet or exercise program, it's important to check with your physician. Also seek the help of registered dietitians, athletic trainers, and qualified exercise physiologists in order to make the progress that you need.